When we look at other species, they too are well adapted to their environments. So these are the kind of bird beaks that inspired Darwin when he looked at the finches in the Galapagos. But these species are adapting genetically. Now one uh, species that can be particularly informative is the other ecologically dominant species on our Earth. So, so the most ecologically dominant invertebrate is the ant. But ants did it the old-fashioned way. They speciated into over 14,000 different species with a dizzying array of local, environment, environmentally specific adaptations. Uh, humans, meanwhile, are genetically relatively homogeneous, and especially given our immense diversity, there's hardly any genetic variation, and only a few local spe locally specific genetic adaptations. Now, I think this question is often not asked, because we think we already know the answer. And the typical answer is that, well, we're smart. We have a uh, big brain. So here you can see on my slide that that's the human brain compared to the chimpanzee brain. So three times the size of a chimpanzee brain. And then we use these big brains to figure out, solve problems. So we solve the problems with intelligence. So the first thing I want to do is try to convince you that intelligence is not the answer, and that there's a much more powerful process at work that explains the secret of our success. So the case that I'm making is that it's not about our intelligence that, that explains our species' ecological dominance, but it's in fact about our cultural abilities, about the fact that we're really good at copying from others. That thing we don't let kids do when they're in school, copy off their neighbor, turns out to be the secret of our success. And essential to making that work is our sociality. So we need to be interconnected with others so information flows among minds. And that's what really generates uh, powerful innovation and adaptive cumulative cultural evolution. This is a concept I call the collective brain. And when you begin to build mathematical models of humans using the actual learning tools that we use, you find out that uh, a robust result from this work is that larger and more interconnected populations ought to generate fancier tools, better technology, and more adaptive repertoires. And then finally, the case I'll make towards the end of today's talk is that this has been going on for a long time, that this body of non-genetic information has been shaping human genetic evolution, and that the products of this cumulative cultural process have been some of the major forces that have shaped our anatomy, physiology, and psychology. So, the recurrent features of the environments that we faced over human evolutionary history are heavily influenced by these cultural products. So this is the output, the cultural adaptations, and these are going to be cultural things, and these are going to be genetic things. So the first example I want to give you is an easy one to understand, or the easiest one to understand. So um, if you look and you compare human anatomy and physiology to that of other primates, you find that humans have strangely small teeth, we have small stomachs, and we have short colons. This makes good sense if you realize we're a primate who eats cooked food. We invented fire. There's an argument about this, but let's say a million years ago. This allowed us to cook. This means our food comes in pre-digested. This releases the selection pressure on having big intestines and a large stomach and big strong jaws and muscles that reach up to the top of our head. We can get rid of all that extra baggage and just cook our food. The thing about fire and cooking, though, is it's highly cultural. If I was to take all of you up to cottage country and say, you know, start a fire with no technology, most of you would struggle to start a fire just from some instinct, would, wouldn't, probably wouldn't fire up. So you, we have to really depend on cultural know-how to do that. But we've been doing that for so long that it's altered our, our physiology and the length of our intestines, our colons. Another fun one is my colleague Dan Lieberman has argued that we're the running species. We have all these adaptations from literally toe to head uh, that show that we're really good at long distance running and human hunter gatherers can chase down antelopes because the antelope collapses from heat exhaustion before a person will. Uh, one of the things we have is we store energy in our arches. We also have a nuchal ligament behind our head that allows our trunk to twist independent of our bodies that we see in other running animals but not in primates. Another cool feature is we have acrine sweat glands all over our body. And these pump out uh, water that is over our body that cools us as we run. So it gives us evaporative cooling that we don't see nearly to this degree in other species. The interesting thing about that is if you look at that system as an engineer, you're like, elegant, beautiful, but there's a big flaw. There's no water tank. There's nothing to fuel the big sweating system that's supposed to do all the cooling. But if you look at how persistent hunters in small-scale hunting and gathering societies do this, they use cultural technology. They use ostrich eggs or skins, or they have knowledge about where roots are that contain water, or trees that contain water, or they know to look in uh, other certain places to find water. So this is a 
gene culture coevolutionary package that explains a whole bunch of features of our anatomy, but only makes sense if you have cultural products that are hard to figure out uh, to start with. Now, I'll just mention um, two others of these. So when you study little kids, you find they immediately start making a distinction between artifacts and other kinds of things, both living and also non-living, non-artifacts. This is a distinction we don't see in other primates, so it looks like we're primed to assume there are artifacts and tools in the world. You wouldn't get that unless you'd had artifacts and tools from which your cognition has to respond genetically. And then finally, my, my last one, and this is what a, a, the center section of the book is about, is this notion of self-domestication. So once you have cultural transmission, you can transmit not only behaviors, but the standards by which you judge others. And that means you can have social norms where if you violate the group agreement, the group rules, you get punished, you get a bad reputation, you can't find mates, you can't find marriage partners. And that then begins to shape the species. So it's self-domestication. We become more docile, more social, more rule following in a way we don't see other species. We actually have many of the features of a domesticated animal, although most domesticatable animal brains shrink and ours expanded. So there is that, that one difference. Why does it matter what human nature is or what kind of animal are we or what the secret of our success is? And I think this is an important question that has big implications for how we do institutional design and policy design because it's often unrecognized but other disciplines have at their core uh, assumptions about human nature. And the problem is, is that most of the time these assumptions go uninterrogated. So economics, a discipline that I know uh, relatively well, uh, has, it's based on an enlightenment philosophy kind of filtered through 19th century philosophers. And that's the assumptions about human nature that we have. And we know that many of those assumptions are wrong and, and misleading. So one of the things I wanted to do with this book was try to say, let's build a new foundation for the social and, and behavioral sciences that's rooted in what we know about human evolutionary biology, but takes seriously the unique nature of our species. And this will allow us to do better institutional design and better policy design, rather than having disciplines based on uninterrogated assumptions about human nature.